Good evening, and welcome to the International Affairs Forum at Northwestern Michigan College, and tonight's conversation with Dr. Rachel Licker, Principal Climate Scientist of the Climate and Energy Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists. My name is Jim Bensley, and I'm the director of IAF at NMC. Thanks again to all who joined us last week at the City Opera House for the Ukraine Relief Fundraiser. Many of you were, that were there know that there were Ukrainian families in the audience, and they were extremely touched by your care and concern that evening. So thank you again. We hope you enjoyed the pre-program reception and were able to visit the tables with our friends from the NMC Freshwater Studies Institute, SEEDS, Circle of Blue, and the Citizens Climate Lobby. They're all doing great things to drive the positive on the rocky and uneven road of environmental change. Welcome also to those tuning in virtually. And please note that both our in-person guests and those online will each have an opportunity to ask questions of Rachel during the question and answer session. For those of you online, please enter your questions in the Q&A function, not the chat function, the Q&A function. And for those here, Students will be delivering microphones so you can state your specific question uh, when it's time to do so. Our program this evening begins with a short pre-recorded introduction by Dr. Licker. She'll then be joined for a live virtual conversation with our moderator, Dr. Lisa Del Boino. After completing residency in anatomic pathology at the University of Michigan and staying on as an assistant professor, bleh, assistant professor for a short time, Dr. Del Bono spent most of her professional career practicing in Traverse City, Michigan, with expertise in GI and breast pathology. In 2012, Lisa woke up to the fact that our climate was rapidly changing and that urgent collective action was needed. So in early 2013, she became a Citizens Climate Lobby volunteer. Now she serves as the state liaison coordinator for CCL and co-leads CCL's action or health action team. In 2020, Lisa co-founded Michigan Clinicians for Climate Action with the des desire to utilize the trusted healthcare voice to educate public and policy makers about the health benefits of addressing climate change. Dr. Rachel Licker, is Principal Climate Scientist with the Climate and Energy Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists. In her role, she provides strategic thinking and technical and analytical exper expertise across the organization, analyzes new developments in climate science, and communicates climate science to policymakers, the public, and the media, which is very, very important. Prior to joining UCS, Dr. Licker completed an American Association for the Advancement of Sciences a science and Technology Policy Fellowship. For her fellowship, Dr. Licker served as a foreign affairs officer with the US Department of State, where she managed its work with the Global Environment Facility Trust Fund. Before that, Dr. Licker completed postdoc training at Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. During that time, she also served as a chapter scientist and contributing author with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's Working Group Two. Dr. Licker earned her PhD in Environment and Resources and her BS in Biology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She also holds an MS in Environmental Studies and Sustainability Science from Lund University in Sweden. Dr. Licker has been quoted in BuzzFeed News, Clean Technica, CNN, The Las Vegas Sun, NBC News, NPR, and the Orlando Sentinel, among other outlets. I must say, it's truly been a joy working with both of these women over the last month. So welcome, Dr. Licker and Dr. Del Bono. Good evening, and thank you so much, Jim, for that warm welcome. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to speak with you all today about climate change risks and responses. I'd like to start with a bit of an overview now of climate change, starting from the global perspective and then drilling down to where we all live, the Midwest.
What we're all looking at now is the first clear image of the earth taken by a person that's now known as the iconic blue marble image. It was taken by the crew on the Apollo 17 mission on December 7th, 1972, when they were on their way to the moon. And for many people around the world, finally seeing an image of our home planet like this highlighted the fragility of Earth and the need to take care of it. So I wanted to start by just taking a moment to really step back and think about Earth and the way that humans are affecting it at this very macro level. One of the things that has made life on Earth possible is that we have something called the greenhouse effect in which there are gases in our atmosphere that trap heat from the sun. This creates a stable environment for life to exist and to thrive. However, since the advent of the pre-industrial uh, revolution, humans started to disrupt this balance largely by burning fossil fuels, which added more heat trapping gases into our atmosphere. So this graph is showing you the trend of the emissions of one of the most important greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide emissions, tied to fossil fuel combustion. So you can see how there's been a steep increase in these emissions since the middle of the last century. And here I'm showing you the graph of the concentration of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere over the last 800,000 years. And you can see how the increased, increased emissions since the mid 1900s have led to carbon dioxide levels that are unprecedented in the history of humans. And that's that big spike at the very end of this graph. In the latest report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is part of the United Nations, found that the atmospheric carbon dioxide levels we're experiencing right now are the highest that they've been in the last two million years. The increase in these heat trapping gases have acted like switching from a sheet to a thick down blanket, increasing the heat trapped on Earth and increasing Earth's average temperature. This graph is showing you the upward march of Earth's temperature since pre-industrial times linked to that increase in those emissions. And this increase in Earth's temperature is akin to a human having a fever. It's one vital sign that has manifested in a variety of symptoms. At the global scale beyond average temperature levels, we see signs of climate change in the fact that for example, the last decade has been warmer than any period for the last 125,000 years. Sea levels have been rising faster than any prior century for the last 3,000 years. And ice cover during the summer in the Arctic has been smaller than any time in the last 1,000 years. Our oceans have been warming faster than at any time since the end of the last ice age and our oceans are more acidic now than they've been at any point in the last 26,000 years. And climate change is not just manifesting globally, it's also having an impact where we live. So here in the Midwestern United States, obviously agriculture is one of the most important parts of our economy. And the latest national climate assessment found that increasing growing season temperatures here in the Midwest are forecast to be the largest contributing factor to declines in US agricultural productivity. Furthermore, the report found that humidity is likely to increase over the next few decades in the region, which would increase rainfall and affect both soil erosion, as well as the number of days that would be suitable for working out in the field. And of course, climate change isn't just affecting crops, it's affecting the people who work on agricultural enterprises too. So at the Union of Concerned Scientists, we conducted analyses in which we projected how extreme heat is likely to change across the century, across the United States, under different global warming scenarios. Um, and then we use those projections to look at how outdoor work time could be affected. Um, and we looked also at how outdoor worker earnings could be affected as well. And what we found in this analysis is that in Michigan specifically, as a result of increases in extreme heat by mid-century, which is not all too far off but at this point in time, without action on climate change, outdoor workers in the state are projected to risk losing $466 million in total earnings each year. 
So beyond agriculture, um, there are many other parts of the Midwest that are at risk of being affected by climate change. Another is our forested landscapes. Um, in the Midwest, forests are expected to face uh, effects from more frequent droughts, invasive species, pests, and disease. And this is also true, effects from climate change uh, for our freshwater resources. Changes to our water resources are not just projected, but very abundantly clear already. We see changes to lake surface temperatures, as well as the ice on and ice off dates, which has major implications for economies and communities tied to lakes and freshwater resources, as well as our culture overall. I know here in Madison, for example, the severe decline in the number of days with lake ice has led to a drop in the days available for ice fishing and also community events that take place out on the ice during the winter. Also, climate change has implications for the air we breathe and our public health more generally. So as an example, I'm showing you here four maps that are looking, showing you um, how premature deaths tied to ground level ozone pollution are expected to grow under different global warming scenarios and time periods. So the top two maps are showing you what's expected in the next few decades in the Midwest under a lower emission scenario that's on the left and a higher emission scenario that's on the right. And on the bottom, you're looking at that same information, but just for the end of the century. So you can see how with higher global warming uh, emissions, there are more premature deaths in the region projected as a result of ground level ozone pollution. And the latest reports that are coming out make it extremely clear that we are very far off the mark of where we need to be to avoid dangerous climate change. But the good news is that we have all the solutions in hand to bend the curve on global warming emissions. We know how to power our homes and industries with renewable resources, such as wind and solar. We know how to run vehicles with electricity instead of using internal combustion engines. We know how to grow food in ways that store more carbon in the soil. Now it's a matter of generating the public and political will. So in 2018, I just wanted to note, because this is really something that you all should be so proud of, Traverse City became the first city in Michigan to commit to a 100% renewable energy goal. And the city's municipal utility, Traverse City Power and Light, adopted a goal to hit 100% renewable energy by 2040. In addition, Traverse City has a long history of wind power, having installed a utility scale wind turbine in 1996 that was at that time the largest wind turbine in the country. So one thing that you all can do to really help take action and ultimately help bend that global warming curve is to share the story of Traverse City's commitment and progress as it can really encourage other communities to do the same and to grow the momentum for state lawmakers to enact better energy policies. So Traverse City is really showing that there is hope and it is possible to chart a safer pathway forward. So I really, again, appreciate you all inviting me here to speak with you today and look forward to speaking with you, Dr. Del Buono, and to engaging in discussion with you and the entire audience. Thank you so much for that clear overview of where we are in terms of climate change. And thank you for highlighting the leadership in Traverse City in terms of moving forward uh, towards a future powered by healthy renewables. We are so fortunate to live uh, in a city where there's really strong leadership in this area. They've not only responded, but they've also worked in partnership with concerned citizens who have ad advocated for this issue and much more. And as you know, today, our governor also announced her MI or MI Healthy Climate Plan to take the state of Michigan in that same direction. Reading the latest IPCC report, though, can make one feel overwhelmed, as you mentioned. So I really appreciate your message of hope that we do have the knowledge to implement a whole array of solutions that will take us into a healthy, vibrant 21st century. We need to generate that political and public will as you spoke. So to give the listeners an understanding of where we're gonna go in this conversation, we will start with a bit uh, more about your background and uh, how you got involved in climate. 
and then explore some of the current issues related to reducing emissions. And finally, we'd like to hear your perspective on how to further mobilize public support, both collectively and as individuals. So to start with your background, um, there are a lot of young people in the audience today. So I thought we might begin by, you know, finding out if you've always had an interest in environmental science and climate change, and how did you settle on a career with the Union of Concerned Scientists? Sure, thanks so much for that question. Um, yeah, you know, I think in looking back, I really have always had a strong interest in environmental issues ever since I was a child. Um, I was that kid and this, you know, halls of school trying to get people to sign my petition to save the whales. And <laughs> I had I my copy it. of, yeah, 101 things, you know, kids can do to save the planet. Um, the climate change wasn't on my radar. I don't think it was something people were really talking about. I'm aging myself, I think, a little bit here. But, you know, when I went to college, I was really concerned about animal welfare. And so I really wanted to do work to address that issue. And then when I learned about climate change at the University of Wisconsin, I realized, wow, this is an issue affecting animal welfare and the environment in general. And so I did really want to pursue that issue um, moving forward. And so um, after I completed my PhD, I knew, well, you know, I think I really want to do work outside of academia on this issue to get more action going. And so I then did that fellowship at the Department of State, got involved in policy and loved it. Um, but then, you know, the political winds turned and changed and I found myself in a, uh, during the administration change um, from Obama to Trump and really felt like I, re I really wanted to work on climate action from outside of the government. Um, and so I felt like my values aligned well with the Union of Concerned Scientists. I felt like I could really maintain my scientific credentials there. I can be a, a staff scientist doing research and I can be talking to policymakers at the same time. So it's a pretty incredible position. What a beautiful combination. I'm so glad that you're doing that because we need you to be doing that. Um, so let's turn then to some current issues related to reducing emissions. You know, I'm sure that the Russian invasion of Ukraine is a subject that's top of mind for this audience. And, you know, as we watch this tragedy unfold, it's clear that one way to diminish the power of Putin and other petrostate leaders that violate human rights is to cut off the flow of fossil fuel revenues. So do you think it's possible that this tragedy might serve as an inflection point? And by that, I mean a point in which the trajectory of transitioning away from fossil fuels might significantly hasten. So I'm curious about that answer, why or why not? Yeah, well, I think it's in the realm of possible that Russia's war on Ukraine could facilitate a pivot from fossil fuels to clean energy. I mean, we're seeing, for example, that BP, British Petroleum, Shell, ExxonMobil, for example, have announced already withdrawals from their investments in Russia. Um, at the same time, though, that industry and its surrogates have actively defended those investments until very recently, including lobbying against wide-ranging sanctions on Russia, which, you know, it's pretty disturbing, I would say. So, you know, following the invasion, um, the oil and gas lobby did not call for sanctions on Russia's oil and gas sector. And uh, some industry backed groups still do oppose crucial sanctions on President Putin and his associates. So, you know, again, um, those kinds of actions are alarming and suggest that this moment leading to a pivot to clean energy um, would really require society holding those companies fully accountable in addition to the efforts that they're making in some respects there. Um, and also really preventing them from benefiting from the moment, for example, you know, the high energy high gas prices that we're seeing here domestically in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, some signs of hope for sure, I would say, but I think it does require you know, public pressure to really fully make a pivot that we could potentially from this moment. So it's public pressure. So we, we, we need to do our part too, it sounds yeah. like. So um, let's look at policy steps that our government, our government and leaders around the world could focus on. You know, as you mentioned, uh, last week's world experts um, on climate change and our governmental panel on climate change, or IPCC, issued their latest report and said that, you know, we're not on track for reducing emissions quickly enough. 
to avoid the worst consequences. So some people fear it might be too late, uh, but my question is to you, um, do you think it is too late or can we st still turn this around? And I know that in the past, scientists thought that decades, that it would take decades uh, for temperatures to start coming down after we stop burning fossil fuels. But my understanding is that newer research suggests that it might only take three to five years, which I think is hopeful. So maybe you could help us understand that a little bit better as well. Sure, yeah, so to start with the question about, is it too late, can we turn it around? Um, again, just iterating the point that, um, you know, I think I made in the presentation that you just mentioned, you know, the IPCC report and research in general is very clear that we are indeed very far off the mark in terms of where we need to be uh, to be able to meet the Paris Climate Agreement's temperature goals of meeting, for example, or, or keeping, I should say, warming uh, no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius over pre-industrial levels. Um, however, that said, there is time to make a big difference and to prevent you know, the most dangerous forms of climate change. And every fraction of a degree really matters. There's a big difference between global warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius versus two degrees versus two and a half degrees over pre-industrial levels. Um, so I do not at all think it's too late for meaningful action. Yeah. And rather, I think that meaningful action is ever more important. Um, so then to your second point, um, in terms of, um, you know, what we know about how global temperature rise is responsive to uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and yeah, so my understanding of what uh, Dr. Mann said and what is in the latest IPCC report is that if we brought carbon dioxide emissions down to zero, the rise in uh, global temperatures would become extremely small uh, in less than a decade as compared with much longer estimates uh, that was previously thought to be true. And the reason for that and the, uh, the result of that difference uh, is because of uh, differences in the experiments, the computer modeling experiments that were used in previous IPCC reports relative to the one that just came out. Um, and so really it's an issue of the science advancing and us better understanding that part of uh, the equation. Um, and so, you know, to your point, yeah, I think there is good news here. Um, I think this means really what this boils down to is that we could see benefits of cutting greenhouse gas emissions far faster than originally thought. So I think that's kind of the, the uh, main nugget. Um, I think it's really important to note though, that there are other impacts like sea level rise or species extinctions, you know, that would not be that quickly responsive and could be irreversible. So good news and bad news. Um, but so going back to that latest IPCC, um, my understanding is that it also indicated that at some point we may actually need to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And the Union of Concerned Scientists uh, have emphasized the need for large scale investment in research and development to remove uh, CO2 from the atmosphere. So I thought I'd ask you, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. And how do you see it playing out? And are there any state or level policies that would be helpful in that regard? Yeah, thanks. Um, so again, yeah, the latest research coming out of the IPCC uh, has made it clear that to achieve the Paris Climate Agreement temperature goals, some amount of carbon will need to be removed from the atmosphere via natural. So think like afforestation or enhanced soil uh, management and agricultural fields, um, as well as technological measures such as uh, direct air capture. So that's basically you can think of these machines that are sucking up carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, and while that's clear, um, it's really important from my perspective that any investments in carbon removal, so that's a line of action that would require in, some, in many respects the development of infrastructure uh, to engage communities that would be implicated so that they're yeah. at the table and able to advocate yeah. for themselves. Otherwise, we could replicate the harms of the past that led to, for example, heavy infrastructure being built typically in low-income communities and communities of color that created a lot of adverse health effects. Uh, in addition, it's really important um, that any carbon removal measures or policies pursued at any level, federal, state, local, um, not be used as offsets and stall reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. 
So for example, we're seeing announcements, I mean, every day, I'm kind of in this wonky world of carbon removal on Twitter. You see a lot of companies investing in third-party carbon removal programs, um, and they're not necessarily in that then required or announcing, you know, commitments to change their own company's practices. Um, so I kind of think of this as the danger is that this could be then kind of that buy an acre in the Amazon, you know, thing that used to happen. Um, and my concern is that it's really like having the icing without the cake. And <laughs> we, we need the whole thing, you know, we need the first and foremost, you know, the first line of action on climate change should really be ramping down greenhouse gas emissions. And then, you know, we have to, to uh, get all the way there, uh, pursue carbon removal measures. Um, and so to do that, to get to that part, uh, as you mentioned, you know, we really need research on these measures because a lot of these measures are not proven at scale yet. Um, so there are a lot of investments being made currently by the Biden administration in this respect. Uh, for example, they announced at the end of 2021 what's known as the Energy Earthshot Initiative, which includes funding for carbon removal research and innovation what that has really the aim of bringing down the costs so that the technologies could be scaled up. Um, and so, you know, alongside that research, we again really need to be pursuing measures to develop guardrails that protect communities and, you know, make sure our policies are kind of pursued in a holistic uh, perspective. From my, from my perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't agree more. You know, the frontline communities who, who continue to be, breathe the dirty air, even though the CO2 may come down, it's, it's not fair. And, they, and a game of whack-a-mole is not fair for those communities. So they need to be there at the table and we need to make sure that, 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 that everything is, we're looking at the big picture. So, um, there are many different avenues by which to address the crisis, climate crisis. There's legislation and regulation, but one that's not talked about very often is litigation. And so I'd be curious, what do you see as the role of the scientists in climate litigation? And uh, would you mind going back to the basic science and helping us understand just how much of the warming we're seeing today is related to humans and how that in turn might be used when uh, in terms of litigation efforts requiring governments to take action. Sure, um, so to start with that part of what, you know, we know about contributions to temperatures and climate change. Again, the latest report from the IPCC states that the best estimate is that human activity has caused about 1.1 degrees Celsius. So that's about nearly two degrees Fahrenheit of warming since the middle of the 1800s. Uh, and the vast majority of that increase is due to the combustion of fossil fuels. Um, and at the Union of Concerned Scientists, we kind of took that uh, work a step further to try to disentangle um, not just all fossil fuel emissions, but how much the emissions tied to the products of different companies has caused that kind of climate change. Um, and so what we found was that the products from the 88 largest fossil fuel producers and cement manufacturers contributed to about 52% of global temperature rise that we've seen since uh, about 18, or I should say between 1880 to 2015. Wow. Um, and so, with respect to litigation, um, part of the reason that that kind of information is important is that there's been a lot of research in kind of other realms from more, you know, political science and history showing um, that there's a lot of evidence that fossil fuel companies invested in intentional campaigns to create confusion about climate science since the mid 1960s. Um, you know, so it's really not a coincidence that there's so much emphasis, uh, you know, sometimes around uncertainty in climate science and right. you know that there's so much skepticism floating around about climate change research and i think you know that emphasis on uncertainty for example is just not an emphasis that we see necessarily in other uh, scientific realms and i always like to think about for example whether people are concerned about the scientific uncertainty surrounding physics and chemistry when they board airplanes for example because that's yeah. the same physics and chemistry yeah. you know that we use in climate science um, and so this kind of information kind of going back now to what I was talking about, you know, tying the global temperature change to products of these companies, that information is uh, really helpful and can be used in holding fossil fuel companies responsible for their efforts to stall action on climate change 
um, and has been used, you know, in court cases and litigation, uh, you know, forming the basis of the evidence and, uh, you know, a sense of responsibility that they have that's distinct and unique. That's really fascinating. That's fascinating. And I, you know, you were talking about uncertainty and I want to pivot to one of the questions I was going to ask a little bit later on, but I think it segues nicely here. Um, you know, it appears to me that one issue that is impacting our ability to address climate change is misinformation and sometimes over disinformation campaigns. So the Union of Concerned Scientists has, quote, fighting misinformation and defending science as really a core principle. Mm -hmm. So could you speak to that a bit and also touch on the importance of the Science Integrity Act and what it is and why it's important? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, just very broadly speaking, science is one of the pillars of a healthy democracy. Um, you know, it's really critical that we have um, you know, policies being formulated that are based on evidence. And at the same time, we have a research enterprise that's able to operate free of political interference. Um, and so that kind of last bit is really, you know, what that Scientific Integrity Act that you mentioned is about, because that would codify protections afforded to federal scientists through agency level scientific integrity principles. Uh, and if it were enacted, the legislation would also help hold violators of scientific integrity policies accountable. And the main point here is really that it would make it much more difficult, therefore, for senior level officials to politicize science based decision making. So essentially, it would give federal agencies scientific uh, integrity policies teeth. Um, so again, just kind of putting those two pieces together. You know, it's really, again, science is one of the pillars of a healthy democracy. If we have policies being made in the absence of any, <laughs> uh, you know, any evidence, I mean, it, it, that, uh, that could lead to very, you know, dangerous things or things that don't serve the public need. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, at the Union of Concerned Scientists, we're, it's a really critical, um, you know, we're always trying to uh, show what science is saying and to both, uh, you know, pursue policies that help to and advocate for policies that are in light of what the science is saying, but also protect the scientific enterprise so that it can operate free from uh, political interference and serve the public's best interest. Boy, I wish you the best of luck in that endeavor. <laughs> and, you know, we've seen uh, just how dangerous it can be, I think, as uh, the pandemic has played out. And so I wish you really, really good luck. Um, I want to touch quickly then on, you know, we were talking about offsets and we were talking about, you know, um, taking carbon out of the air and, and how we have to look at things holistically. And, um, you know, it makes me reflect a little bit on uh, on populations that have uh, been disproportionately impacted historically. And we know that our, you know, the, the Union of Concerned Scientists have been a great, great resource for me personally, as, as I've been learning about, um, excuse me, the public health impacts of climate change. And so um, I just want to uh, think about that in terms of indigenous communities and people of color, as well as rural and low income uh, communities, they're often the first hit by climate impacts and air pollution and other environmental hazards. So I wonder if you can speak a little bit to how transitioning away from fossil fuels will result in immediate health co-benefits, especially for those communities and how certain populations are, are disproportionately impacted by climate impacts, especially like extreme heat. Absolutely. Um, yeah, there has been some incredibly powerful research that's come out in recent years on the effects of fossil fuel related air pollution and public health impacts. Personally, there, I think one of the most stark studies in that respect was a study led by the University of Birmingham in the UK that found that in 2018, more than 8 million people died from air pollution created by the combustion of fossil fuels. That's one in five deaths worldwide in one year. And the reason for this um, is because when fossil fuels are burned, they create particulate matter that is dangerous for people to breathe in, thus contributing to these premature deaths. 
And as a mom, it really broke my heart to read in this study that thousands of children under five die each year from respiratory infections tied to fossil fuel combustion. That's just devastating to know. Um, in addition, we know that low-income communities and communities of color, as you mentioned, oftentimes indigenous communities have poor air quality as they're more likely to be close to industries or infrastructure such as bus depots, for example, that burn fossil fuels. Um, and so if those industries and transportation mechanisms are run on clean energy sources, those communities would immediately benefit. Yeah. Um, and certainly we know, you know, other climate impacts, as you mentioned, like extreme heat also fall disproportionately on the shoulders of those communities. Um, we know, you know, the study that I uh, was referring to about outdoor workers, just as one example, we know that outdoor workers disproportionately identify as Hispanic, Latino, Black, and African American. Mm -hmm. um, those workers, for example, outdoor workers uh, have no uh, federal, there's no federal requirement to, uh, uh, there's no federal heat standard to protect outdoor workers from extreme heat exposure. And so to this day, we have outdoor workers dying on the job because of extreme heat exposure right here in the United States. Um, so there actually is legislation that's been proposed to get at that issue. Uh, it's called the Ascension Valdivia Heat Illness and Fatality uh, Prevention Act, uh, named after a um, farm worker who died after harvesting grapes, I believe it was, uh, for, uh, you know, I think it was something like 10 hours straight in triple digit conditions, asked for help and was denied it and died mm. in the car ride home with his son. Um, you know, so we just know that, you know, these workers uh, are not being protected the way that they should be and are being put in a position of having typically to choose between their health and a paycheck. Um, so that's just one sliver, one window into that issue. Um, but I think it's a good example uh, and one that really um, kind of manifests in similar ways for a lot of other different climate impacts. Definitely. Um, and, you know, I, it brings me a lot of hope to think that we can address climate change and in the same time change conditions that uh, would uh, impact these populations in a positive way. So thanks for making that clear. I want to be sensitive to time and uh, give other people a chance to ask questions. Um, but I want to also just ask you in closing, um, is do you have any suggestions about what the average citizen can do to help the situation? Or are there other important points you'd like to make before we take questions from the general audience? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think one of the most important things we can all do is vote and also to ensure that everyone has the access to voting too. Um, it's really critical. You know, we see a lot of infractions upon that happening at the moment. Um, so I think that's really a systemic issue that also affects the climate crisis and, you know, all sorts of other issues as well. Um, but kind of the main point there is, you know, we really need to ensure that we have, I mean, for many reasons, we need to address that issue. But one being, you know, we really need to ensure that we have leaders who are going to, you know, uphold science for climate change and other issues as well, and really uh, take action commensurate with what, you know, science is saying is necessary to protect people across the United States and the world. Um, and as I mentioned in my presentation, I think there's a lot uh, that folks right, you know, there in Traverse City can do to bring hope to other communities, which is, I think, an ingredient missing for so many people right mm -hmm. now. Um, you can really help show what, you know, other communities could do and follow the leadership that Traverse City has taken on the issue of climate change. Um, and that kind of inspiring message is really powerful. It shows it's not too risky to take action. I think that's something a lot of leaders tend to be risk averse. And so if they see they're not going to be the first, there's other, you know, there are others who've taken that action that can help kind of grease the wheels and make it more possible. Um, grease with non-fossil fuel based. <laughs> um, and then also, uh, you know, it also really shows again, not just that it's not risky, but that it's possible. Again, these are not pie in the sky ideas. These are ideas that again, we have the solutions in hand right now. Um, and so they are possible to be pursued. Thank you so much, Rachel. You know, I reflect on my father who was a World War II vet and actually worked in the gas and oil company. And um, he was so proud when I started working on climate change and he, he was like, 
I don't understand why people are scared to embrace the future. He, his whole life was about embracing new technology and the future. And we have, we have solutions. We just have to have the courage to do that. And um, I think voting is just such a great example of how our democracy, if it's healthy, can work for our health as well. So Jim, did you wanna uh, pose some questions? <laughs> Let me first say thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Lisa, for that very insightful look into something that affects us all, right? It's something that um, will be with us, certainly, for a number of years. In fact, I often see 2030 and 2040 and 2050 thrown out when uh, scientists are giving these dates. and. And you know, and, and that's worrisome, maybe not to folks that are 80, 90 years old, but certainly for our young people. And we have some young people in the audience today. And I wanna make a, take some effort to thank them for coming to this, to learn more about something that they will be dealing with uh, for a long time. So let's get into our questions. We have a question from Janet, she says, how will the move toward electric vehicles impact the environment and climate by the increased demand for electricity? Yeah, really, really great question. Um, well, we know that certainly, obviously, uh, it's it's sort of an interesting question because um, you know we're obviously pursuing uh, you know electric vehicles and electrifying all sorts of different industries is really one of the important measures to um, combat the climate crisis but that needs to be put together with decarbonizing our power sector as well. Um, and so we really need to be, um, you know, in, to ensure that those electric vehicles, our homes, our buildings, our industries that are being electrified are ultimately then being powered, um, you know, not by just, you know, another gas fired power plant, a coal burning power plant, but by wind and solar. And that's where investing in renewable energy resources is so critical to kind of, you know, get at that whole circle and that whole issue. Um, I don't know if Lisa, if you had anything else you wanted to add to that point, maybe from a health perspective or. No, I, I think, um, I think you said it. I think I'm always struck when I look at different um, modeling techniques like the En-ROADS MIT modeling, how you just don't get the emissions reductions or the health benefits if you don't do what you said, Rachel, which is to um, change the sources of energy that's powering our electric motors. So we electrifying is great, but we, we have to change uh, the sources of energy, just as you said. Thank you. So for those of you in the audience here at the Millican Auditorium, we have two students who have microphones. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll get one of them to run down. Okay. Are there any uh, offices at UCS to which I could send some plans uh, for cities, uh, 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 ocean vessels, uh, transportation in general. I was on the faculty at the, uh, the Art Center College of Design, Switzerland, and spent 31 years in Europe, where I observed that they use one fifth of the energy that we do on average. Yeah, um, please go ahead. My, I believe my contact information was shared at the beginning of the talk, and I um, am very happy for that to be shared again as well. And I, um, we're, we're a pretty tight team. It's a big organization, but a tight team, and I'm always happy to pass along good resources like that to my colleagues. How, I mean, it seems to me that difficulty in the climate pro sphere now really has to do with persuading the public of the truly dire consequences of climate change and that it is a reality. There is so much fantasy in this public scene now. How do you get through that? Thank you. Well, from my perspective, I see it. Um, I think there are sort of multiple levers that need to be, you know, uh, touched upon to be able to affect that change. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, um, you know, a lot of the U.S. public is having conversations and is sort of stuck in this uh, skepticism that you're you're noting. Um, 
but not randomly. You know, I think that there, there's been this huge investment by fossil fuel companies in these sort of disinformation campaigns to create this kind of confusion. And so we're kind of having the conversations and we're stuck in this like lack of action that I think was the goal, you know, of those campaigns. And so, um, you know, one of the, the big labors that we're trying to push upon at UCS is getting at that corporate accountability trying to provide the scientific basis for litigation that can hold those fossil fuel companies accountable. Um, but, you know, there are other forms of changing that social license from those companies as well that anyone can really participate in. Um, you know, at universities, for example, there are a lot of divestment campaigns that are happening, trying to, uh, you know, push upon universities to divest from fossil fuel investments. Um, same with retirement funds and other kinds of, uh, you know, investments that the everyday person might sort of be attached to in some way. Um, and then, you know, we also, you can join up um, with other activist groups. I mean, Union of Concerned Scientists has an activist network that you can join in to add your voice into that to create that public pressure. Um, and then at the same time, you know, apart from that, you know, we've been doing a lot of work for many years now to tr try and really emphasize that urgency and importance. Um, so, you know, we're really trying to provide a lot of information at a hyper local level um, and not in the, you know, far off, but the near term so that people can really understand how climate change is likely to manifest for them and also what the solutions and benefits might be for taking action. Um, if you go to our website, www.ucsusa.org, you can find resources like our Killer Heat Report, where you can actually go in and download uh, a congressional district, uh, or I, I should say, we have this congressional district map where you can go in, click, you can download a two-page document, print it out on one page, and take it to meet with your local representative to show them, look, this is how extreme heat is likely to change right here in our district affecting your constituents. This is what we have potentially to lose and what we could gain by taking action. And so we're really trying to kind of connect the dots between getting that information out there into the public's hand so that, that they can ultimately be empowered. You can be empowered to do something about this issue. Thank you. That's a, that's a great question and a great answer. Um, i take a question from our virtual viewers now. We've got one from Karen. She says, how do you assess the threat from melting permafrost, forest fires, and other extreme climate events happening in Russia? Given how poor our relations are with Russia, how might we best make a positive impact? Um, well, I think, um, I mean, in terms of estimating the impact, certainly, you know, there's a lot of technology from satellites, for example, um, that can be used to be able to es estimate cl climate impacts, you know, anywhere on the planet. So we're able to, you know, seamlessly get that information, that data to be able to detect those trends. Um, and then in terms of making a positive impact, I mean, particularly on those issues in Russia, I'm not sure if that that was exactly the question specific to those issues. Um, you know, I guess uh, it, it's an interesting question. I, I guess I'm not quite sure how to directly affect what's going on on the ground there with respect to permafrost melt, for example, but, you know, we can, you know, the United States um, putting pressure on our leaders to be able to engage to protect the Arctic, for example, the Arctic Circle, where this is happening. There's an, a body called the Arctic Council that actually is, is getting at and addressing that issue. The U.S. sits on that council. Um, and so, you know, pressing upon your representatives to push upon the executive branch to, you know, enact policies to protect that part of the world, um, I think is really, is really critical. Um, and luckily, you know, we've seen, I think, an increase in leadership in that space. Um, you know, there was kind of leadership a lull, and I think we are hoping that the U.S. is kind of coming up back and stepping up there a bit more. Uh, yes, thank you. My name is uh, Ed Dolan from Northport, Michigan. Uh, <clears throat> you've made a very eloquent case about need for uh, climate action and particularly for stronger climate policy. I wonder if I could ask you to be a little bit more specific what you and the Union of Concerns scientists mean when you talk about uh, better climate policy. Uh, for example, are you thinking 
uh, primarily of regulatory measures. Like right now in Michigan, we have a bill before the legislature that would lift uh, restrictions on installation of home solar? Or are you looking more at technological fixes like I uh, know President Biden recently has proposed using uh, uh, more ethanol to, uh, to substitute for gasoline? I know there's quite a bit of scientific controversy about that. Or uh, finally, are you thinking more about uh, economic solutions like the uh, Citizens Climate Lobby recommends, which would uh, impose a fee on carbon pollution and use some of the revenue from that fee or all the revenue from that fee to compensate uh, vulnerable communities. Uh, where do you stand on specific policy issues like that? Which ones do you think would work and which ones do you favor? Yeah, thanks for that question. I mean, honestly, we work on so many different fronts. Uh, we have the Climate and Energy Program. We also have a clean transportation program uh, underneath the climate and energy program. We have our climate campaign, our corporate accountability campaign, and an energy campaign where we're all working in tandem. We also have a food and in, uh, environment program. We're all really working in tandem to try and address this issue as holistically as possible. I mean, at the moment, I'll say that you know one area that we really are trying to put a lot of pressure is with respect to Build Back Better. Um, you know, that did pass the House, but it is stalled right now um, in the Senate side. Um, and we really see that that legislation would launch the United States towards a clean energy economy and make historic investments in clean energy transportation uh, or clean energy and transportation, as well as climate resilient agriculture and environmental justice. Um, and that legislation would really help address climate change through really important tax credits and incentives that would get more clean energy on the grid, electrify cars, buses, and trucks. And it would really help put a significant dent in the U.S. emissions um, and be, quite frankly, the most uh, far-reaching climate legislation our country has enacted to date. Um, but again, as I mentioned, it's stalled in the Senate right now. Um, we're hopeful that negotiations will continue and there will be a consensus that can get signed into law. I definitely would say, you know, based on what I just described about that and how powerful it could be, it's definitely one of our priorities with respect to policy. Um, and then, you know, that is obviously the legislative side and we are doing a lot of action on the executive side uh, as well. Um, in addition to the judicial side through litigation, but I'll focus here, you know, on the executive branch um, and say, you know, from a federal level um, in its first year, the Biden and Harris administration really came out swinging on climate change from day one, you know, immediately rejoining the Paris Agreement, setting ambitious targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So now really, I think where we're at is, you know, with the growing urgency of the climate crisis, it's really critical that the administration follow its plans with concrete and durable policies. So it's not just about targets and goals and aspirations, but, you know, we're looking out the window and we're seeing wind turbines going down the road and, you know, solar panels being installed that everyone can access and afford. So, you know, we're really trying to, okay, now we need to uh, get these policies actually enacted. Otherwise, the U.S. would fall short, you know, of curbing heat trapping emissions reductions this decade, protecting communities and really meeting its responsibilities to the world. Thank you. Another one from our online audience. If human carbon-based temperature rise is 1%, what causes the rest of the future temperature rise? And must we accept that amount as inevitable? If human caused temperature rise, I, I didn't quite, could you repeat the question again? Yeah, if human carbon based temperature rise is one degree, I'm sorry. I oh, one degree, one okay, one, one percent. Degree. I was, okay. That's, That's where I got, I got, okay. Could you then just finish repeating it, please? <laughs> so what causes the rest of the future temperature rise and must we accept that amount as inevitable? You know, we have different, at, at the moment, you know, we've already committed ourselves uh, to 1.1 degrees Celsius temperature rise over pre-industrial levels. That's already happened because of human activity. And so, you know, moving forward, um, any additional uh, temperature rise because of human activity is based on the decisions and the choices that we make today. As I mentioned, we have the solutions in hand to bend the curve on global warming, but we just have so much in the way, um, you know, fossil fuel companies, keeping their hand on the scale, you know, really uh, swaying politicians to not sign measures like Build Back Better, um, you know, 
disagreeing with being in the Paris Agreement, et cetera, et cetera. And that's not just happening at the federal level. Obviously, this is happening at the state and community level as well. Um, and so it's really about, it's about the will to, to deal with this problem. Um, we have the solutions. Um, you know, science is clear about what could happen. Um, sure, there's some natural variability in how temperatures change based on, you know, different things like volcanoes. But really what we know is that warming, global warming, climate change, it's because of human activity. Um, and, you know, we have detected that signal. And so, you know, bending that curve and avoiding dangerous climate change is about what we decide to do about the problem. Great. We have time for about two more questions. We'll take one from our in-person audience right now. Hi, uh, my name is Charlie Schlinger. I live in Traverse City. I have a question that kind of gets at uh, how to motivate, um, you know, institutions uh, from uh, doing, uh, kind of having, trying to have it both ways. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, the college here has a flight school program in Traverse City. They consume in the neighborhood of 60,000 gallons a year in leaded aviation fuel. Um, that lead is dispersed over lower income neighborhoods in Traverse City. Uh, I happen to live in one of those neighborhoods. It came as a shock to me to learn about this. And so how do we motivate institutions uh, who, who continue to act as though they can have it both ways. They can uh, continue business as usual, and they can also uh, you know, make uh, statements as to uh, you know, what they're doing uh, about climate change. Um, just your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, well, first of all, I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, I completely, uh, it breaks my heart that we deal with these kinds of pollutants and issues across across the country um, and you know that it's just still in this day and age we're dealing with lead pollution issues. I hear in Madison lead paint is such a insidious issue. I, I deal with it myself so <laughs> with a toddler at home it's it's awful and so I'm just sorry just to say that. Um, but with respect to um, the issue of motivating, you know, I kind of spoke to this a little bit when I was talking about carbon removal and how we're seeing a lot of companies coming out touting, you know, well, we're investing, you know, millions of dollars, you know, huge sums of money um, in what essentially could turn out to be offsets programs. So they're going ahead with their corporate pact practices as business as usual, not actually changing anything and paying someone else to remove carbon from the atmosphere. But at the end of the day, you know, they're not actually doing anything differently. And so I think it's really, really critical. First of all, you know, are we talking about, you know, private entities and thinking about who do we support, you know, when we're purchasing things and we're consumers? Um, do we have an ability to affect things in that respect? Um, you know, then again, who are our local representatives who we can bring that issue forward to, to, you know, create requirements that companies need to, you um, you know, be responsible in their communities um, and not create these kinds of, of health hazard and public health hazard issues. Um, I think, you know, exposing it also is really, really important. Um, bringing it out into public discourse like this, um, you know, at Union of Concerned Scientists, we put out reports that really help to shine a light on this issue of those disinformation campaigns from fossil fuel companies that really you know, we're having trouble seeing the light of day, but when, you know, people saw it from the, for their own eyes, the internal documents from these companies spelling out, you know, here's what's actually, what the intentions were and what they did and intended to do. It's rather shocking. I mean, myself included, I was shocked. I didn't actually really think at all about corporate responsibility before I joined UCS, but sort of the scientist in me seeing this evidence, like, wow, this is actually happening was shocking. Um, so I think there are a lot of different ways, you know, again, through public discourse in your community, raising it up, um, you know, getting a group of other concerned citizens and residents together to talk about it and start to put pressure locally. Um, and again, you know, thinking about things from the consumer side as well. Um, and then thinking about, you know, 
this is bad for your business. It's going to be bad for your business if people are rallying together to push back against you. You know, it's critical for people, for companies to be responsible to the communities that they're operating within. Thank you, Rachel. Our final question comes from Arthur, and I think uh, you've touched on this before, but I think it's a good question because it allows some space to talk about some solutions on this one. So Arthur says, speaking of uncertainties, what are the quantitative uncertainties associated with temperature forecasting by global circulation models? What is the probability that temperatures will exceed the stated goals for 2050? What should be done? And I guess there's a lot of questions in here. What should be done to adapt and accommodate environmental change? And what is being done now to prepare for that possibility? So hopefully, Rachel, you'll leave us with something, something, yeah. a nugget in there that's a good one. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> I'd be happy to. Um, with respect to the uncertainties, gosh, I, I would have to go into some reports to look for those specific numbers. I'd hate to quote some inaccurate numbers to you, uh, you know, off the top of my head. So um, you know, what I can say is that when we're talking about, uh, you know, best end estimate numbers, um, you know, and likelihoods, um, you know, we're talking about numbers that the scientists in these consensus reports have deemed, you know, really significant. Um, and so, but anyways, that's, that's a really uh, broad, that's not really answering your question. And I apologize that I can't provide a specific, happy to follow up afterwards. Um, I think my email is in the chat. Um, with respect to what is happening across, you know, different places and communities, again, Traverse City, I mean, look at what you all are doing in terms of the commitments that are being made with respect to renewal, renewable energy and commitment to become, you know, 100% uh, reliant on renewable energy resources. So that's just an incredible sign of hope. Um, you know, we see also different, you know, youth groups getting engaged and and saying, hey, you know, this is about our future. And so I think that's created a huge amount of inspiration for local leaders, Traverse City and elsewhere to really take this issue seriously to make sure that we're leaving a better planet behind. Um, you know, with respect to adaptation, um, you know, there's a lot of work to uh, protect communities who are dealing with sea level rise, also extreme heat. Uh, Miami-Dade just actually hired on their first heat officer, chief heat officer. Um, which is really interesting that now they're kind of um, embedding the issue of extreme heat, which is inextric inextricably linked to climate change, um, you know, into their local government and really creating a position that's solely focused on that and thinking about how to protect the residents from this public health hazard issue. Um, you know, we see uh, across the country different, you know, farmers, foresters, different, you know, people who are operating these kind of private enterprises um, coming up with novel solutions, uh, you know, both to suck up more carbon on their farms and their enterprises and also to be part of that solution. Um, so I think you just, we see it kind of happening in different ways across the country. Um, again, I, I think I've been particularly inspired by the youth movement um, and, and what they've been able to accomplish um, in terms of really motivating and inspiring people and, and really catapulting us forward in the direction that we need to be headed. Thank you for that answer, Rachel. I think uh, you make an important point. Um, the, the youth, the young people have a responsibility, I think, as, as all we all do, but perhaps even more so with their creativity, their energy, and things that they possess to help us maybe solve some of these, these implications of climate change. So I wanna thank both you, Rachel, and you, Lisa, for being with us tonight and inspiring us, enlightening us, and hopefully making us more attuned to what's happening in our world. So appreciate that. Thank you all. Let's give them a big hand. Thank you to all of you who came out tonight, and we look forward to seeing you in May. Remember, International Appetizers will be here. So, <laughs> so please join us again for that. And for the Leadership Circle, we'll reconvene in about five minutes for your, your time with Rachel and Lisa. So thank you very much. <laughs>